Hello again, and uh, welcome back to Engineering 211 Statics. And uh, I wanted to start uh, with a, a really a new area, an exciting area, that being equilibrium. If you're following along in the uh, textbook by uh, Hibbler, we have uh, finished up chapters one and two, and uh, also then uh, skipped ahead to four, and we're going to go back and look then at uh, chapters three and five. So if you're uh, tr again, if you're trying to follow along in your readings, we're doing chapters three and chapters five uh, kind of simultaneously, and I may refer back to that again. <clears throat> well, in the study of equilibrium, if we go back and we look at Newton's laws, and I'd refer you back to uh, our first couple lectures for that. But remember, Newton's first law said that a particle remains at rest or con uh, continues to move in a straight line with constant velocity unless it's acted on by an unbalanced force. So what what is that is really saying is that it's moving in a straight line with constant velocity unless acted on by an unbalanced force. We can say that the acceleration is equal to zero. So looking, um, looking at Newton's second law, the sum of the forces is equal to mass times acceleration. If we look at then using zero acceleration. If the acceleration is equal to zero, we get then that the sum of the forces, the, the forces would be a vector, the sum of the forces is equal to a zero. Um, and we could then expand this if we wanted to and say that we would have the sum of the forces in the x direction is equal to zero and the sum of the forces in the y direction equal to zero. We could of course do the z direction if we wanted to and we'll talk about that later what this looks like in two dimensions and what this looks like in three dimensions. Now we could also if we wanted to do the sum of the moments is equal to the mass moment of inertia i times the angular acceleration alpha where uh, if you think of something rotating, if that rotational rate is uh, sped up or slowed down, uh, it would have some angular acceleration. And I really gives a measure of how the mass is distributed about some axes. Well, if we look at its rotation as a constant velocity, this would be equal to zero. And we would then get the sum of the moments is equal to zero. And for our purposes with that, we could look at the sum of the moments about any axes, but for our, mom, our, our purpose, we'll probably do it most about the z-axis, or the, the axes coming out of, out of or into the paper, if you will. So the sum of the moments about the z is equal to zero. So those are going to be our equations. And we'll talk more about what happens if we have more directions. Uh, do we have more equations? The answer is yes. Uh, but for a lot of our problems, we will uh, have these three equations that we will uh, use. And as I mentioned last time, we have to be careful. This uh, sum, when you um, sum up the moments or you sum up the uh, forces, you need to be careful to include all of those. So we need a, a tool to help us have a proper accounting of forces because if we leave off just one of them, uh, we're going to get a, a, a wrong answer. So let's talk about a tool that we use to do that. That's called a free body diagram. Free body diagram, we're going to use this an awful lot. In fact, any problem from now on, we should always draw a free body diagram of it. It'll just be something that we uh, do, becomes uh, part of how we operate and who we are. Um, but free body diagram oftentimes will just say FBD for shorthand because we do it so much. But there's some uh, rules or points. Engineers often like to have uh, lists of uh, uh, things to follow. Uh, the first one is, is what to draw a free body diagram of. Okay, and uh, we're going to look at some examples, and we might we could draw a free body diagram of the entire thing. We could draw a free body diagram of just one part. It really comes down to what we are looking for, what information we're giving, given, and what information we are looking for. Then we want to isolate that part. And isolate the body or the part from all other uh, bodies or parts and re, uh, replace the uh, interaction or the reactions with other pieces with forces. 
and we'll say it that way. Apply all apply all forces that act on a body or part. And finally, we might want to indicate our coordinate system. Okay, indicate our coordinate system. So we could look at something as uh, simple as maybe a uh, person standing on a uh, on the floor. Okay, happy person standing on the floor. And if we look at drawing a free body diagram of this happy person standing on the uh, floor, happy. So we would have uh, some forces. People recognize the uh, weight force. Weight is really just equal to mass times the acceleration of gravity. And then we would have, and this is the one where we really have to always keep Newton's third law in. Remember, we talked a little bit about Newton's uh, first law and second law and the development of our equilibrium equations, but Newton's third law is every bit as important. says that the force of action and reaction between uh, two bodies is equal, opposite, and collinear. So everyone's pretty comfortable when you're standing on the floor, you're pushing on the floor, but the floor is also pushing back on you. We might name that N. A lot of times we'll call that the normal force or the restoring force. Um, so that would be a proper free body diagram for you standing on the floor. Maybe we could uh, say with a coordinate system, we'll take an XY coordinate system, a horizontal a vertical coordinate system. And it, it's not always horizontal vertical. We, we may rotate it. So in, in the future, it's probably important to say which coordinate system we're going to use. But this simply allows us to take and remove the person's interaction with the floor and figure out what's going on. If we then look at this diagram, it's pretty easy to figure out uh, <clears throat> what the, the normal force is. So using a free body diagram is, is going to be very important. You might say, well, I, I, I could get this without a free body diagram. And well, again, this is one of those things we want to practice on easy problems because it's going to become very important on problems that uh, get difficult to deal with. Let's look at some um, different free body diagrams. We're not going to get into the analysis of things, but I want to practice free body diagrams. So we'll look at uh, several physical situations. And you could also uh, look at some of the tables at the beginning of Chapter 3. Chapter 3 in your textbook is equilibrium of a uh, point or particle, which all the forces are collinear, or, I mean, not collinear, but coincident on a point, so there's no moment. And then Chapter 5 expands on Chapter 3 and talks about uh, the equilibrium of a body or where you would have a, a moment. Like I said, I've chosen to just do, tackle those both at the same time. But let's say that uh, someone comes along and gives us a cantilevered beam that looks like this. And we have a couple of uh, forces applied to this, and maybe we've got a concentrated moment applied at the end. We would go from this physical situation to the free body diagram. What's the free body diagram going to look like? Well, you could look up at the um, in Chapter 5, early in Chapter 5, it has a table of what this fixed support looks like. And the fixed support will support a force in that direction. We will say that this is a reaction 1, and a force in this direction, reaction 2. And it will support a restoring moment. We could say that that's M. Now we're going to have to, so we've, we've represented this reaction here. If I remove this uh, support at the left, I replace those with forces and couples or moments. And now I can put the applied loads back on here like this. Now, presumably, hopefully, we would know this one. We would know that one. And we would know that one. And we'd be left with three unknowns. We hopefully have three equations then, two equations there and one equation there, or, or right here, if you will. And we could solve this problem. So if you're, if you're wondering, well, how did he know to take this thing right here? and turn it into two forces and a, a moment. Look at the, uh, the helpful tables at the beginning of Chapter 5 and Chapter 3. And it actually has some nice physical pictures of things and then shows how we, we model those and then goes one step further and shows how we, we build a free body diagram from that model.
Well, let's try something else, maybe a bit of a truss structure. And it's going to be a while before we actually get into the internal forces of a truss. That'll, that'll be our next uh, chapter. We've got a few lectures to do before that. Let's see, we've got something like this, and we've applied a force P to that. And we have a pin connection over here. And we have a roller connection right here. And we could do a roller connection a couple ways. A lot of times I'll just put a, a roller like this, or sometimes we will show a roller like that. Could, uh, could be done either way. So if I want to go from this physical situation here to what a free body diagram looks like, I'm not going to get uh, bogged down in individual members on this thing. Ran a little long. So I've applied the load. You need to always put the loads back on. And then this point here, it'll uh, resist with two forces. We'll put a uh, horizontal and vertical. You can put them in any direction you want. You want them at right angles to each other. So I'll say that we would have a couple of reactions here. Um, maybe we'll call this point A. We could call this A X and A Y. And then over here at uh, we'll call this point B, or this could have been B. The roller. If you think about the roller, if the roller is frictionless or negligible friction, you would have a force like that. You could say that it's just B Y or B. Now you might say, well, how did you know to put this force in uh, going to the left, or how did you know to put this one down? Well, I really just guessed. And if I made a uh, bad guess, we'll just get as we as if if we were to assign distances and forces to this, we could solve it. And we if I made a bad guess, we'd come up with a negative number there. Okay. A lot of times, as you get some experience, you can start to look at the problem and say, "Yeah, I think from uh, experience that that force is going to go a certain way," and you'll put it in and hopefully avoid the negative sign. Uh, Avoiding negative signs is nice because then you don't risk losing a negative sign and things like that. Um, but it's not something you want to spend a lot of time fretting about um, because you can just put the force in either way and let the uh, negatives take care of themselves. And some problems are fairly complicated. It's hard to see which way it's going to go. In that case, just put the force in and let the negative take care of itself. So um, maybe we'll try one more problem. Maybe we've got uh, some sort of a beam. Here and it's uh, got a point here that comes up and touches there. And we'll say that that point up there has uh, no friction. And maybe we've applied a uh, concentrated moment to the end of this. Maybe we'll apply a uh, force like this, and maybe for good measure, we'll apply a force like that over there. Okay. So if I want to come up with a free body diagram of this thing, when we say no friction, we're probably a, we should say negligible friction. Probably not really anything such as no friction around here, but uh, negligible just means it's very small in comparison with everything else. Um, which we have a lot of that. If you've ever tried to maybe drive on uh, um, ice at a freezing point where you maybe your uh, tires are kind of cold and the ice is right at freezing and then you have a layer of water in between, uh, it is very close to uh, no friction or, or aptly described as negligible friction. Well, let's draw this free body diagram of this beam portion. Okay, and I could apply the loads, this one, this one, and then this concentrated uh, moment at that point. Now the, uh, the 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 friction point that's a little bit like a roller in there, isn't it? So I could put that perpendicular to that surface, and then this pin here. You could do this a couple different ways. You could put the uh, force like this. So we could call this R1, we'll call this R2, and uh, R3. Okay. Well, if you wanted to, you could have rotated. I mean, you could have just as well have done it like this. 
apply this uh, concentrated moment there that load that load this one is still going to be the same and if you wanted to you could uh, say that well I'm going to put this one like this and this one like that so you could have your R2 and your R3 like that uh, what would be the difference with these values would be different but then you could resolve them into a horizontal and uh, vertical coordinate system if you wanted. So the, why would you pick this one over uh, this one? Well, if you choose a coordinate system that's horizontal and vertical on this one, and incidentally, I haven't done a very good job of indicating that, probably a uh, X and Y coordinate system is going to be good here, and an X and Y coordinate system is going to be useful here. And like I was, I was saying, if we took an X and Y coordinate system here, this is probably a good way to go if they want to find the horizontal and vertical reaction at the pin. Uh, but maybe they want to find the reaction here that's uh, parallel and perpendicular to the beam itself, in which case a rotated coordinate system could be useful. We could rotate X and Y like this. So it depends on what you're looking for and what you are uh, given. And this is just as valid as this. Now you don't want to try and mix these up, um, but if you if you do it this way or you do it this way, um, those are both valid approaches. Could you, having done it this way, come up with these values? Yeah, you would just resolve these back onto here. And if you knew the angle uh, that that beam was, you could do that pretty easily. So again, if you're you're struggling, well, how do I treat this roller? How do I treat this pin? How do I treat this fixed connection? Go and look at those tables at the beginning of Chapter 3 and Chapter 5. And there's actually a lot more. These are the most common, a pin connection, a roller connection, and a fixed connection. Uh, but they have a lot more in terms of bearings and thrust bearings and journal bearings and things like that. So that's worth looking at at the beginning of Chapter 3 and then more so at the beginning of Chapter 5. So I wanted to bring in some more real-life examples and uh, see what those looked like when we tried to turn them into uh, free, to free body diagrams or add free body diagrams to them. So let's say that we've uh, got this. And your author has a variety of great uh, pictures like this. I brought in some pictures uh, from outside so you have access to more pictures and also so we didn't violate any copyrights. Um, but uh, let's say we've got a, a small uh, backhoe here or digger or whatever you want to uh, call that. And we'd like to uh, come up with a, a free body diagram for it. Uh, we'd like to account for the weight of the machine itself itself and the uh, load that it has. Looks like it's got some tires there. So I'll do this with a, a fairly large pen, uh, pen. We would expect um, that the, uh, the load from these tires would be probably fairly close to the center there. Uh, that Those dimensions we might have to go find or they might be given. So I'm going to uh, put that in there. We could say that that is the, uh, the load. And then uh, presumably this uh, uh, tractor or backhoe might have a, a center of mass or center of weight given here or maybe it would be uh, measured and we could put that in. Maybe it would be uh, given in a variety of different uh, ways. Maybe it would uh, not only be the, uh, the, the weight and the uh, center of that weight for the uh, entire tractor but maybe it would be given for the tractor and then we would be given it for this uh, um, backhoe attachment. So we might call this uh, weight 1, and we could call this weight 2, and maybe even the loader assembly would have some center of mass. We could call this weight 3. So depending on how the, the, the data is given. If the uh, operator constituted a significant portion of the weight of this, we might want to include uh, that. But let's figure that we've got the load there now, we've got the uh, weights there now, and what's going on here in terms of the reactions. A lot of people are really comfortable putting the loads on and the weight of the vehicle itself. But remember the ground's pushing up on this vehicle. We're going to have some reaction here like this and then we are going to have a reaction 
uh, like that. We could say that this is reaction at the uh, front, and we could say maybe this is the reaction at the rear. And that I'm accounting for both tires, or it will, there'd be half of this, assuming it's symmetrical on each front tire, and half of this on each rear tire. Now, if we were thinking about uh, this vehicle uh, ac accelerating forward, we might have to put in a, a tractive force, but uh, I won't clutter it up with uh, that right now. We'll just assume it's in a, a static situation like this. Well, what do you do with this? Uh, if uh, we're concerned about uh, uh, tipping, maybe we're uh, lifting something more than uh, uh, some old tires and we're concerned about tipping, we know that the criteria for tipping is that uh, these tires will just come off the ground. That is, if this is equal to zero, that's our condition for tipping, isn't it? So we can start to answer some interesting questions about the entire thing in terms of uh, uh, tipping and, and, and things like that. So I just wanted you to uh, get, a, get a sense for this picture when someone comes along and they show a uh, free body diagram uh, like this of a, uh, a vehicle here. Let's see how my drawing goes. Not doing too well here. And they've got the uh, weight here. Whoops, not the weight. I guess we said that was the load. So we'd have some load. We'd have always got to have the steering wheel. Then we'd have the uh, weight and our reactions at the front and our reaction at the the rear. When we uh, when you see something. Uh, like this, someone's done some calculation, you you know what they're getting at. We usually don't have an actual picture to draw the free body diagram on. We're usually looking at something like this, but as we start uh, studying this, I wanted to uh, to show them on an actual picture so you get a sense of what we're trying to, to keep track of. Now, we might choose to, to zoom in to that portion right there. And let's look at this uh, next picture. Got two backing sheets since I'm using a heavier marker. So that's just uh, zooming in on this piece here. We've zoomed in on that piece there and we can, might ask some different questions. Um, we recognize that we have a, a, a pin here. Okay, uh, let's say that this would be a, uh, this is a pin. And uh, while we're talking about this, this uh, cylinder, that's a hydraulic cylinder of course, that's a classic two-force member. That is, the uh, force is acting down the axes of that, that member. And we'll talk about the implications of that in a moment. Well, if we have a pin, we know that that pin, and I, I'm going to look at this really just in, in two dimensions here, uh, so we'll account for this. Uh, imagine that this uh, arm back here wasn't included in this, and we, we were just account for uh, this one pin, and then you could uh, divide that by two if you wanted to include the other pin. So we know the pin will support a force in uh, two directions, horizontal and vertical. And, and incidentally, your author has a nice table at the beginning of chapter three and beginning of chapter five to help you with what does a pin do and what does a roller do and things like that. So we might talk about uh, reaction one. And then we could put reaction two there. Now we don't want to forget the weight. Uh, again, that's our weight or the load. Uh, maybe that includes the weight of the bucket. Maybe we'd have to put the bucket on there uh, separately. Now, this uh, a pin is is interesting because if I come in and, and look at this pin and say that, well, that's a pin, so it supports a force in the horizontal and vertical, that would technically be right, but I would be looking at one unknown, two unknowns, and then two more unknowns for four unknowns. This is really the only thing that I would presumably know would be the weight there. Um, so it would be a lot better thing that it, that I would then, rather than looking at this as a pin, look at this as a two-force member and say that I have some force in the cylinder there. So now how many unknowns do I have? I have one unknown, two unknowns, and I have three unknowns. I know the angle of this. I could get that from the geometry. So with three unknowns, I have three equations. I have the some of the forces in the x is equal to zero, some of the forces in the y is equal to zero, and some of the moments is equal to zero. So I can tolerate three unknowns, one, two, three unknowns. So 
be careful. Sometimes when you see something, you see a pin, and you, you put the two forces in, maybe it's a two-force member. Uh, and that's important to notice because if, if we just said, well, this is a pin, we would have four unknowns and we wouldn't be able to, to solve this problem. Um, and again, you're probably not going to see this in, in a picture, uh, but what you are going to see is uh, something like this. I can do a little better job of drawing this. So we would have the weight acting down like that. We would have these reactions here, R1 and R2, and then we'd have this force in the cylinder coming back like that. You might say, well, how'd you know which way to, to draw these? I didn't. I took a good guess. Once you've been around this for a while, you can oftentimes uh, get these in the right direction and thus minimize negative signs. But if you just arbitrarily put these in, the worst thing that'll happen is when you get done, you may solve for R1 and you'll find that you get a negative sign indicating that the real force is going the opposite way. So you don't have to get too carried away with what direction it is. I usually try and put them in in what I think is the positive direction so that I can avoid negative signs, but it's it's not worth a lot of worrying. Now, what if we were to uh, want to draw a free body diagram of this, this uh, lift arm right here? What would that look like? Well, if I come down and I look at that uh, lift arm, we've got something like that. And remember, by Newton's third law, that these forces on this pin, they have to be equal and opposite, right? We would have R2, if it's going to the left there, it better be going to the right there. And if this R1 is going up, it had better be going down there because this uh, lift arm is pushing up on the bucket and the bucket is pushing down on the lift arm. As you were to pull this together and put these together, these should cancel out as you would expect. Okay, So uh, something to think about, we'd probably have to come up here and deal with the uh, other end of the cylinder and whatnot, but if we were just looking at this, this pin that's what we would have there. So again, you're probably not going to be putting free body diagrams on a picture, but I wanted you to recognize when you see something like that in someone's work or in the textbook or something, what's really going on. Well, let's uh, continue on here. And, and normally we'd have dimensions and uh, weights and things like that, but uh, I want to just get uh, initially comfortable drawing free body diagrams. So we'll look at another scenario here. We've got a uh, forklift uh, that's uh, lifting something. So we could uh, come up with a uh, free body diagram uh, for this one. What are we going to have there? Well, we've got some, some weight here, right? Um, you could, if you wanted to, uh, you could draw a free body diagram for, for this thing and say that you have some weight acting down. So you're going to have some uh, force that has to pull up. And it would not be uh, very difficult to recognize that if you sum the forces in the vertical direction, setting those equal to zero, that F has to be equal to W. Okay, um, So I think a lot of you probably would be able to just come up here and uh, recognize that immediately and put that W right there. But if you um, were uneasy with that, that's how you do it. So this brings up a good point. A lot of times it's a, a trick to figure out what do you draw in the free body diagram of? You draw in the free body diagram of this load or you draw in the free body diagram of the heister. Sometimes if you don't have enough in information, you might have to go draw a free body diagram of something else. And these should actually be in a line. My picture's a little bit skewed. Uh, hopefully a better engineer than a photographer. Well, so we've got the uh, the weight out here pushing down on these forks. What's going on with the uh, the forklift? Well, presumably it's got some center of mass. Maybe we have a uh, center of mass here. We could say that we have weight one, and we probably have a large counterweight here. This is all counterweight. Oftentimes you'll deal with the counterweight separately because it could be ordered with different types of counterweights and different sizes of counterweights. So we'll say that that is uh, W2. Now, we have to hesitate and use some good engineering judgment on trying to use the weight of the operator uh, to balance this thing, because if the operator then uh, gets off to, to put a uh, move a pallet or put a sticker under there, um, 
probably should set down the load, but uh, you know they may not always do that. Uh, you could end up with this thing flipping over. In fact, uh, when I was a uh, uh, much younger, working through high school, I worked at a machinery dealership, and our forklift seemed to be always a little undersized, so we had a, uh, a rather heavy mechanic that used to then sit on the back here. I was at that time a real skinny guy, so I would drive, and the heavy mechanic would sit on the back, and uh, we used him for counterweight. So that probably wasn't really uh, OSHA approved, but a good good example of statics. So I've got my load here. I've got the weight of the forklift. Of course, I'd need the distances, and we could either measure that or, or, or that would be given to us. I've got the weight of the counterweight, and what's happening back here? And this uh, has just one wheel under it, so there's a little wheel hid there. Okay, so that's going to be the reaction from the rear wheel or the steering uh, wheel, and then the reaction there. Okay, and again, if this is, let's say that this is reaction one and this is uh, reaction two, could we solve this? If this weight is known, if this is known, if that is known, and this is this is our load, right? So if those three are known, could we solve for this? Yeah, of course we could. Uh, uh, solve for that. Um, we could ask answer questions about tipping. Again, uh, what constitutes tipping here? I think if you were an observer standing much uh, where you are looking at this picture, if you were looking at this wheel and you, you saw someone lifting something heavy and you just saw the wheel come off the ground, you just started to see light underneath the wheel, you'd say, oh, you're about to tip, right? Watch out, you're about to tip. Well, that criteria is when this is equal to zero. That's when you have tipping. Okay, so you may not be tipping. This may not be equal to zero, in which case you have to find uh, those two. Uh, but if it, uh, if you're concerned with tipping, uh, then you're going to set that equal to zero. And again, I just wanted you to see a, a real physical situation, physical situation that I took a picture of, and see how that looks in terms of a, a free body diagram. So if someone comes along and draws this uh, free body diagram that looks like this. So we've got some weight there. And that's what you're going to see. Hopefully we'll see some of that in your homework, uh, test papers, and the uh, textbook and whatnot. What, what is that picture about? Well, it's a representation of a physical situation like that, so we can have a proper accounting of the forces. Again, I haven't put attractive force here, um, or uh, brake force, whether we're trying to accelerate or decelerate, because uh, I assume it's just uh, sitting uh, static. Now, one thing that's probably worth uh, talking about is if I look at um, this situation where, um, and I look at tipping, let's say I'm concerned about tipping, and I, I, I so with, with tipping, this would be equal to zero, and I look at the position of the load, whether the load is relatively low like this, okay, you can see that the uh, uh, forks are up kind of high, here, but this is hanging down, so the, the load is relatively low, would it tip more if the load is, is high in a uh, situation like this? Well, what's the free body diagram going to look like for this one? Well, we'll see. Maybe I'll draw that free body diagram over here. Okay, and so this is way up here. Maybe I'll exaggerate it a bit. And we have our weight. We've got our uh, reaction at the front. We'll call that R1. Uh, this is uh, R2. We'll say that uh, we have the uh, weight of the bare truck, W1, the weight of the uh, counterweight, W2. So that would be my uh, free body diagram for this. I won't uh, continue to clutter up the pictures. We're going to start moving from the pictures to the actual diagrams. But let's go back and look at this picture that we had here. So if we're concerned about uh, tipping, 
We don't want this thing to tip over. We know tipping is going to happen when that is equal to zero. So what's a good equation for tipping? Well, it would be to sum the moment about the uh, front wheel or the front tire, right? Setting that equal to zero. Okay, so I'm summing the moment about that point right there. So effectively, I'm looking at this load times this distance, and then that's counteracted by the weight of the truck times that distance, and the weight of the counterweight times that distance. Okay? Does it matter whether the load is up or down? No, because this distance remains the same whether that load is is up or down. So this is something that students kind of struggle with. Um, is it going to tip over easier with the load up or down? In a static situation, the answer is is no. Now, you get started uh, moving this uh, mass, tipping it forward and back, uh, the, the, the whole thing changes. Or certainly, if you start to accelerate, you start to move forward or back, they have a whole different argument. We'll have to talk about that next term in dynamics. But if we just look at the static situation, we look at this vertical, whether this load is up or whether this load is uh, down here like that, it doesn't matter because of that, that distance. So sometimes uh, students struggle with that, and that's probably a point worth uh, uh, noting in this uh, situation. So uh, we'll keep beating up on this problem a little bit. So we were concerned maybe with uh, uh, tipping or, or uh, tipping of the uh, entire thing, but maybe maybe that's not what we're concerned about. Maybe we're concerned about uh, failure up here with the uh, forks, how the forks are attached to the carriage. And um, if you if you spend some time uh, looking at this, and uh, this takes a little bit of experience in this, these forks are held on like this. Is it a bit of a taper in the forks? So, um, Another thing, big no-no, is actually having holes cut in the ends of the forks so that stuff doesn't slip off. But uh, anyway, uh, so don't do that if you have to do an inspection. But this usually has a, a little cleat like that that hooks over that. And then there's a uh, little little cleat on the bottom that keeps it from uh, uh, popping up if the uh, the load were to go the other way or were to keep um, what really is a problem is if these forks can uh, flop around if you're backing up and this catches something the fork will flop over and hit the driver so uh, there's usually a, a little uh, cleat there hopefully so if we were to look at a free body diagram of this we've got the weight here the weight of our, uh, our load there or welder or whatever. So we've got the uh, weight of that. We might say that the weight of the forks would be uh, negligible, or maybe you want to put the uh, weight of the forks in there. Okay. Um, and then what's going on here? This um, is going to have some force. There'd be a uh, reaction one that's holding it up. This is just down here to to uh, to keep it from uh, coming up the other direction. You're probably going to have a significant force here, R2, right? You could imagine uh, the, the top of that fork is trying to pull away from that fairly significantly. And finally, you'd have this R3. I think you'd imagine if you were to get your finger underneath there, uh, the bottom of this fork would be uh, pushing in there. And, and to come up with this, you, you need a little bit of experience in how these things are put together. I don't think this picture gives you a good enough view, uh, but I could uh, try and, and guide you through that. I think if you could uh, look at this in a better picture or up close, you would then recognize this. Well, what does this tell us here? Well, we have a, a known, the load. We have a known, the weight of the fork or forks, depending on whether you're using one fork or two fork forks. And then we have three unknowns, R1, R2, and R3. Could we solve this? Yeah. Some of the uh, force in the x is equal to zero, some of the forces in the y is equal to zero, and some of the moments is equal to zero. So we could um, solve for those, which is important. How much uh, force is being exerted here in the vertical direction, uh, how much force is being exerted here, and how much force is 
needed uh, there. Those are all important things if we get to designing the forks or the carriage and the uh, attachment there. So it's not just about uh, uh, tipping like we saw. Oh, well, that's important. You don't want to build things that uh, tip over too easily. Uh, we can use this technique to look at the uh, individual uh, pieces. Very important. Well, sometimes I think I got one more picture of this. Sometimes it may not be as, as easy as that. Uh, something like this, we've got a uh, distributed load here, right? So you could imagine uh, in the uh, previous example, we had a, a, a nice uh, force here. This was a pretty straightforward. That was acting right there. What do we have here? This is a little bit harder. We'll talk about uh, later on about distributed loads, but we might have a distributed load like this. And this is going to be our motivation for being able to deal with distributed loads, is trying to figure out, well, what does it amount to? How could I replace this distributed load with a single concentrated load? And where would that single concentrated load act? Okay, uh, so I don't want to get too far into this. I mean, it's, the, the, the free body diagram down here is going to be exactly the same, uh, but it is a motivation for when we get to distributed loads on why we need to uh, to be able to do those um, so that we can uh, solve problems like this. Well, I'll quit uh, picking on that problem and uh, finish up with one last problem bit of a, a hypothetical problem, but a problem that comes up uh, quite often. Um, I was talking to someone about uh, hanging up their uh, kayaks in the uh, the garage and uh, what kind of forces they get to, what kind of forces are trying to pull them away from the roof and whatnot. And uh, a problem like this answers that question nicely. And I think uh, may, you may come up with a uh, result that uh, will, will surprise you. So given this situation, we have a pulley system. We've got some weight here. And... Uh, this uh, rope is attached here, rope or cable, goes around that movable pulley, up over this pulley, and down like that. So that, uh, that pulley there. So we'd like to figure out what the tension is. We'll assume that these uh, cables are uh, by and large vertical. And we'd also like to figure out the reaction up here. Presumably we've got uh, some force up there that we would like to, to try and find. So let's see if we can do that. If I look at a uh, free body diagram of this piece, what does that free body diagram look like? I'm going to have um, the weight is acting down like that, right? And it will have some reaction here. And if I sum the forces in the vertical, setting that equal to zero, I can say that I have R minus uh, W, and you get that R is equal to W then solving that equation, right? So R is equal to W. No surprise. A lot of you would uh, zip right past that step, but uh, for completeness sake, I'll put that in there. So then if I draw the free body diagram of, of this uh, lower pulley, what do I have? Well, I have R that I found was equal to W, so that's good that we know that. And then I have a couple forces there. Uh, maybe I will call this um, R2 and R3. And a lot of you would say, well, R2 is equal to uh, R3. How could we prove that? Well, if I look at the uh, radius of this, so maybe I'll uh, draw this, probably drew that a little bit small, so blow it up just a little bit. There's R2, R3, there's, uh, we'll just call that W. And I'm going to say that this has some distance lowercase r. That's the radius of that pulley. We're going to figure that the pulleys are negligible in mass. Uh, not uh, not weightless, but compared to the value of W, very small enough that we can uh, ignore them. We're going to assume that the rope doesn't stretch very much, and we're going to assume that the pulleys are round. Okay, So those are some assumptions that are important to make. Well. If I sum the moments about the center line of this, okay, there's the center line of that, setting that equal to zero, what do I have? I have R3 times the distance R, that's going to go counterclockwise, and then minus R2 times the distance R, because that's going clockwise, this force W intersects the center line point there, I and mean, you could add that in if you wanted to, W times zero, of course that goes away. 
and you uh, solve the important equation here that R2 is equal to R3. So a lot of you just recognize that. Uh, that's how you could show that mathematically. Now the next step is quite important to say that uh, summing the forces in the vertical direction is equal to zero. And I have then R2 plus R3 minus W is equal to zero. Well, if R2 is equal to R3, I can say then that uh, R2 is equal to R3 is equal to W over 2, right? So that's a, a good conclusion. Now I'm going to go up and draw the uh, free body diagram of that piece and see what that looks like. So I'm going to have um, something that looks like this. If I, um, I said that I had R3 there, so I better have R3 pulling down there. I have this uh, piece here. And where that's attached, I had R2. Then I've got some tension T. And finally, I've got this uh, reaction at A. Let's call that R sub A. Okay, so I've got that reaction there. Now you might say, well, that's a fixed connection up there, so I'm going to have or a pinned connection. I've been a little bit uh, uh, vague on what that is. But let's say that you know you said it was a pin. So you have that one. Well, if I sum the forces in the horizontal direction, setting those equal to zero, I know very quickly that that one's got to be equal to zero, don't I? That's the only horizontal force. So we're really just looking for that uh, RA. Well, if I uh, sum the moments about that uh, pin, right there, we'll say that that's the uh, pin. And we'll say that this is, again, uh, lowercase r. I don't know if it's the same as that lowercase r, but uh, it doesn't really matter. So some of the moments about the pin, setting that equal to 0, r sub a intersects that, r2 intersects that. So really, I just have t times the distance r minus r3 times the distance r. And that time I took counterclockwise as positive and clockwise as negative. Well, if I solve this equation here, I could say that T is equal to R3. Well, do we have R3? Yeah, W over 2. So therefore, T is equal to W divided by 2. And I uh, think a lot of you probably would have recognized that from some basic mechanics or physics. You note that that's um, a half the load. Now the bigger question is what's the reaction up at A? And a lot of people might be tempted to say that it's W, but I think you'll be surprised what the answer is. If I sum the forces in the vertical direction here, setting that equal to zero, I have what? I have uh, RA, that's going up, minus T, minus R2, minus R3. Well, if I make the substitutions for those, I could say that uh, RA is equal to, what was T? W over 2 plus, because I'm moving these to the other side now and solving this equation right here, R2, didn't we say that was W over 2 also? And then R3, moving to the other side, it becomes positive. W over 2. So what is RA? It's, uh, let's see, W3 halves W. So one and a half W. So you've got quite a bit more uh, force here. Half again more force because you're pulling down with that. So this one is, is one that people uh, recognize quite readily. Uh, this one is one that kind of sneaks up on people. So that's an important one to, to think about. Well, uh, hopefully uh, we've given uh, you something to think about that you uh, recognize when you see some of these free body diagrams. What is, what's going on with this whole thing? Well, it's really just an accounting of an actual physical situation like we saw in some of these pictures. So I encourage you to look at the uh, pictures that your author has and also uh, tackle the homework. This is like riding a bike. You can read about it and look at it all you want. you got to uh, hop on it and try it. So uh, give that a uh, shot, and good luck on those free body diagrams. Take care until next time.